right. So, hi, everybody. And thank you so much for coming out for another edition of Nationwide Live Stream Star Party with the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory of the Smithsonian Institution. And tonight we're welcoming our friends back from the Central Florida Astronomical Society, the Emil Beeler Planetarium at Seminole State College, and Brian Cummins, a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador in Chantilly, Virginia. Now tonight I'm super excited to welcome my friend, Dr. Shane Larson, uh, from Northwestern All University. Right. So, and hi, everybody. And thank you. And Sierra. Huh, and Sierra. Okay, so I'm going to tell you guys, and sorry there, I didn't have the mute on on my computer, uh, on my audio. So you get to hear a little of that, that back going. All technology. I am the technological problem tonight, you guys. So if you don't recognize me for usual, I am Amy C. Oliver, the Visitor and Science Center Manager at Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory. You also know me as the nerdy astronomer, and tonight I'm the witchy astronomer. You're going to see a little bit of costume going on. So uh, I'm going to get back to our introduction. Dr. Shane Larson from Northwestern University and Sierra has been my friend for many years. We've done all sorts of hilarious things together, like sneak into the Clark Planetarium in Salt Lake City, Utah, to uh, use the gravity waves exhibit after dark, um, and talked about a lot of things like gravitational waves. So Dr. Shane Larson is the Associate Director for the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics, or Sierra, at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Sierra says about Dr. Larson that his research interests are primarily in, you guessed it, gravitational waves, but also in data analysis. And he is also interested in many different aspects of cosmology, binary star evolution, gravitational dynamics in exoplanetary systems, and Earth's climate. Not to mention lots of things that go bump in the night. Space is really great for that. Now, other things that are really fun about Shane are that he is a skilled Lego architect. And over the years, I've seen him build a number of really interesting things. He's also a pen aficionado and has a number of really beautiful ink pens. And we're talking ink in the bottle. And he was also the winner of the 2018 Instruct Instructables Optics Contest for his tutorial detailing the construction of a very large backyard Dobsonian telescope named the Cosmos Mariner. Now, if you're always up for great science, I recommend that you follow Shane on social media and you can find him as the Science Jedi on YouTube and various other social media platforms. And without further ado, I'd love for you all to welcome my friend, Dr. Shane Larson. Hi everyone, thank you Amy for that uh, very kind and great introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I hope you are all safe and well and enjoying yourselves during these trying times. Astronomy, I'm sure as many of you know, is a refuge from the ills of the world. It's an opportunity for all of us to think about the bigger place that we all share in the cosmos. And one of the things I'm always very grateful for the opportunity to do is come out and talk to people about things that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I particularly love talking at things like this, uh, star parties, because in addition to being a professional astronomer, I'm also an amateur astronomer. As Amy uh, has told you, I have backyard telescopes and I do enjoy going out and looking at things uh, in the night. But what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight is about our own home in the universe. Behind me is the artist's rendition of the Milky Way galaxy. It's one that many of you may recognize or have seen before, but is a view of our home that we have never ever had because we live deep down inside the Milky Way uh, and we can never see it from the outside as it is in this uh, artist picture. But part of the story that we'll talk about tonight, at least briefly, is the fact that we understand the structure of the galaxy and we understand the nature of the galaxy because we've looked at other galaxies and compared them to our own. In a very similar way, the only reason we know things about other galaxies is because we can see this one up close. We can study it from the inside and we use those studies of it from the inside to tell us things about the galaxies that are much farther away in the universe. 
So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk just briefly about how we discovered some of the things about the Milky Way. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my group does, which is we study or we're planning to study the Milky Way using gravitational waves. OK, so let me go ahead and start a few slides. And those will help frame our discussion as we go. I'll promise not to bibble babble for too long, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, I am at Sierra at Northwestern University. Uh, Sierra is an interdisciplinary center for astrophysics. And one of the important things about modern astrophysics is that it very seldom is an endeavor you do sitting at home alone at your desk. It is complex, it is very sophisticated, and there are lots and lots of different things that you have to be able to do to study the distant universe. And that takes a lot of different people with a lot of different expertises that may not necessarily be your own. And one of the beautiful things about our organization at Northwestern is we have people who are physicists, people who are astronomers, people who are engineers, people who are computer scientists, all of them working together in order to do this thing that we call astrophysics. OK, so uh, my social media is also there and uh, there's a link to my blog where you can read about all sorts of things that we work on uh, and that I like to talk about. So I want to start tonight by just um, framing the conversation in the following way. The absolute hardest problem in astronomy has always been and still is the problem of measuring distances. This is the beginning of something we call the logarithmic map. It's a way of compressing the entire universe into a finite amount of space and showing it to you. So on the left side of the image, uh, we'll scroll by here in a minute, uh, things are shown very spread out. You can see small things. And as we scroll to the right side of the image, uh, things are more compressed together. And so you can see very large distances in very small spaces. The point in showing you this image is that for most of us, we've never been beyond the left side of this image. Virtually every person on the planet has never been farther than 40,000 feet above the surface of that small blue marble you see there on the left. The farthest any human has been is right there, the moon. Okay, And the only people who have been to the moon are the Apollo astronauts. But no human has ever been past that point. But nonetheless, we talk about the universe and we talk about the things in the universe that extend far beyond the reach where we've ever been able to actually go. And the way we do that is through the science of astronomy. We harness technology to build telescopes to help us see farther away than humans can ever possibly go. But to understand all these things that are scrolling by us, ranging from the planets in our own solar system to stars, to distant galaxies, even to the last vestiges of the Big Bang, the thing that we have to understand is how far away are these things that we're looking at so that we can understand what we're seeing in our telescopes and with our instruments. Measuring distance is fundamentally the hardest problem in astronomy. We measure distances through a process that leapfrogs from close measurements in the universe and then kind of bootstrap their way to farther and farther distances. If you read about cosmology, this will be something you've heard called the distance ladder. And the distance ladder is only possible to be built because of a single person. And that single person is Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Henrietta Swan Leavitt was an astronomer. Uh, she was born shortly before the 20th century started, uh, and she died in 1921. She was one of the earliest women in the country to get a degree in astronomy from uh, Radcliffe College at Harvard. Um, and then she worked at the Harvard College Observatory for almost all of her career as one of the famous Harvard computers. Now, I like to uh, say to people, and I very deeply believe this is true, is that she is fundamentally the most important person in the history of astronomy because she's the one who cracked the riddle. She's the one who discovered how to build that first rung on the distance ladder so that we can measure distances out into the cosmos and understand all the things that we're looking at. Appropriately enough, the thing that she discovered we call Leavitt's Law. It's a little technical to explain, but the way I like to summarize it, I've, I've written here, which is there are certain kinds of stars, we call them Cepheid variables, that if you can, with a stopwatch, 
measure how long it takes them to get bright and dim again, there is a way to understand how that time, that cycle, that periodicity, uh, tells you how bright the star actually is. And if you know how bright the star actually is, you can tell how far away it is in the universe. Okay, so for those of you who've studied astronomy, this is usually called the Cepheid period luminosity relationship, but Henrietta Swan Leibniz is the person who figured it out. It was not lost on astronomers that she had broken the riddle. And almost immediately astronomers set about harnessing the largest telescopes of the day to try and figure out how to use it to measure the first distances we could out beyond the nearby universe. And that meant measuring the size of our own Milky Way galaxy. And the first person to do this was Harlow Shapley. In 1918, Harlow Shapley was at Mount Wilson Observatory. This was around the time that the 60-inch uh, telescope was in prime use and the 100-inch telescope uh, was just being constructed. And I think in 1918, it hadn't quite been constructed yet. Shapley was interested in the star systems called globular clusters, okay? And you can see these uh, in your backyard telescope. There's about 150 of them known around the Milky Way. Most large galaxies have them. Uh, large galaxies like elliptical galaxies, if you look at M87 in uh, Virgo, they can have as many as 10,000 globular clusters around them. These star clusters have been among the most important ones for us to study in the history of astronomy because they have some of the oldest stars we know in the universe. They are very tightly bound, so they're kind of clusters of 100,000 or 500,000 stars uh, held together in a ball by their own gravity. And it's that kind of uh, collection of them that helps us believe that they've been around for a long, long time. And by studying them, we can understand the evolutionary history of the galaxy around which they can be found. So Shapley was interested in where are all the globular clusters around the Milky Way? And as soon as he discovered Leibniz's law, he knew that he could use it to measure the distance to all the globular clusters, simply by looking for some of these special stars that she said we could look for in each of the globular clusters around the Earth, okay? So this was his goal, to measure all the distances to all the globular clusters. And the output of that study was a map, okay? So this is a reproduction of Shapley's original map the sun is the yellow sun thing there in the middle, and each of the green dots is a globular cluster that he measured the distance to. And what you'll see is that all the globular clusters are scattered all around the sky, but they're actually not centered on the sun. Uh, they're centered over on that red X there, somewhere off to the right of the sun. And Shapley very reasonably assumed that the globular clusters shouldn't be centered on the sun, they should be centered on the Milky Way itself on the galaxy, that the galaxy itself was the big kid on the block that had the most gravity and so would influence where the globular cluster should be. So if the center of the globular clusters was over there at the X, that must be the center of the Milky Way. So Shapley, by looking at the globular clusters using Leibniz's law for the very first time in history was able to measure the position of the sun in our own Milky Way galaxy. So here again is an artist's rendition of the Milky Way viewed from above, a view that you and I cannot have. And the sun is located about two thirds of the way out from the center of the galaxy in uh, one of the uh, branches of the spiral arms called the Carina Cygnus arm. Uh, it's about 27, 24,000 light years away from the center. Of course, you don't just have to look at globular clusters, you can start measuring the distances to all Cepheids that you can find in the Milky Way galaxy. And it didn't take long for people to measure the size of the galaxy itself. And the Milky Way from edge to edge, the luminous part of it, the part you can see with a telescope, um, is about 100,000 light years across. Now, as astronomers, we get very used to thinking in the context of light years. Light year is the distance that light travels in one year. And since light travels faster than anything else in the universe, a light year is the farthest distance anything could travel in one year. Okay, we travel much slower than, of course, even in our fastest uh, jets and spacecraft. 
But to convert that into normal language that you and I might be familiar with, 100,000 light years is 588 quadrillion miles from one edge of the Milky Way to the other. And I say ordinary language because I used miles there, but I would argue that almost none of us has any sense of what a quadrillion is. It's a number that I said when I was a kid and I went out trick-or-treating when someone asked me how much candy do I hope I would get, a quadrillion pieces. But a quadrillion is an enormous number, far outside the experience that any human has ever had, okay? The Milky Way is vast, vast beyond uh, our ability to understand. And that was actually the source of much consternation for a long, long time. Uh, and that's another story which we won't get in today. But let me, let me focus on the Milky Way itself uh, because that's gonna lead us to this discussion that I want to have about what gravitational waves are. So if you go out in your backyard away from the city lights, uh, especially this time of year, you will have the good fortune of being able to see the Milky Way. It is a faint gossamer band of light that arches up from uh, the area of the constellation Sagittarius here in the northern hemisphere, up over your heads and down back towards the northern horizon. That band of light is the combined light of the hundred billion or so stars that the Milky Way is made up of that are not bright enough to be seen on their own, but together they make this faint glow that you can see in the sky. It is shaped like it is in the sky because you're looking at the Milky Way from inside that big flat disk, like the pictures that I've already shown you. You're basically looking at the Milky Way edge on. If you want to kind of uh, by hand do that to help yourself understand, uh, go down to your kitchen and get a plate or a pancake and look at it face on. But if you hold it up to your eyes and look at it from the side, you'll see it looks like a long thin line. And that long thin line is this band of light that you see in the sky, okay? Now the Milky Way is about 100 billion, 400 billion stars. It depends on what you, what you uh, do when you try and estimate the numbers, but it's a lot of stars. And what I spend most of my time thinking about is not the stars that are alive, but the stars that are dead. We study the stellar graveyard of the Milky Way because over the entire history of the galaxy, stars, just like people, they're born, they live long and lustrous lives doing their things that they're supposed to do, and then ultimately they perish. And when they perish, they leave behind skeletons, just like we do when we die. Those skeletons in stellar astronomy have special names, which you may be familiar with. Some of them are called white dwarfs, is the fate of our sun to become a skeleton like a white dwarf. Some of them are called neutron stars, and some of them are called black holes. Now in that stellar graveyard, stars, by virtue of the fact that they're often born together, they often live their lives together in pairs, in what we call binaries. That is to say, they orbit around each other in exactly the same way the moon orbits the, sun, uh, the earth or the earth orbits the sun. So stars can also orbit each other. And when that happens, there is always the very strong chance that when they die, their skeletons will remain and orbit each other. And when that happens, we can detect those orbiting stellar skeletons, one going around the other, using gravitational waves. And that's what my group does. We simulate the stellar graveyard of the Milky Way. We ask what stellar binaries are there of these dead stars, and then we simulate what their gravitational wave signals might look like, okay? So for those of you who know about gravitational waves, you've probably heard about them in the context of uh, the current generation of observatories that are on the ground. Uh, they're called LIGO and Virgo have been the two that have been most active, but there's a new one called Kagra in uh, Japan uh, that is coming online, and very soon there will be one in India as well. Gravitational waves are the faint echoes of gravity that binary systems generate when they orbit around each other. And this movie that you're showing here is one of my favorite movies, uh, Illustrating Gravitational Waves. It was made by my colleagues at NASA. And what, it, uh, what I want you to notice from this movie is that this is one of the few movies I've ever seen that shows gravitational waves are three-dimensional. They move outward from a system that's creating gravitational waves in every single direction. 
which is why they're useful things to detect in order to do astronomy. If a pair of white dwarfs or a pair of neutron stars or a pair of black holes is generating gravitational waves, no matter where I am in the sky around this source of gravitational waves, I can detect those gravitational waves provided I can build an observatory capable of doing it. The other thing you should notice is that these gravitational waves are exquisitely structured. There's a lot of shape and structure and pattern in the gravitational waves that you see this binary shedding off. And that is very similar to detecting the light from a planet or a star. By looking at the structure and changes and spectral shapes and colors of the light, we can determine what the properties of the stars are. And in a very similar way, by looking at the structure and shape and behavior of the gravitational waves, we can tell you things about the properties of whatever it is that generated the waves. So this is what our job as gravitational wave astronomers is. We simulate gravitational waves on computers typically. We look at how they change when the properties of the object generating the gravitational waves change. And then we go compare it to data that we get from this new generation of observatory, these gravitational wave observatories. Now, I actually work on a future gravitational wave observatory that's about 10 years in the future. It's called LISA. That is an acronym for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. It is being led by the European Space Agency. NASA is a major partner. So there's a very large community in both Europe and the United States and around the world uh, working on LISA. The idea is that we have three individual spacecraft and they are arranged in a triangular configuration. The distance between any two spacecraft is about two and a half million kilometers. Okay, so this picture is way out of scale, okay? But we shine lasers back and forth between the three spacecraft and by monitoring how long it takes the laser light to fly between the spacecraft, we can detect the passage of gravitational waves through our solar system from distant astrophysical sources, whatever they may be, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about the stellar graveyard that we're interested in and how we're going to measure it with gravitational waves. Oh, this is Lisa built out of Lego, for those of you who have never seen uh, Lego spaceships before, okay? So as I said, uh, science is a collaborative endeavor. And so the things I'm gonna tell you that I work on, I work on with a great number of people. Uh, the four people across the top are my four closest uh, faculty colleagues that I work with. Uh, Vicki Caligara there is the director of Sierra here at Northwestern. Uh, my colleague Matt Benequista is recently retired from the University of Texas. Uh, my colleague Brett Bolin is at Grand Valley uh, State in Michigan and Patty Perdue is at uh, Col Colorado College in uh, Colorado. Everyone down in the bottom is a current or former student who has worked with me. So uh, Dr. Katie Brevik and Dr. Michael Katz uh, most recently finished their PhDs. They're both postdocs now. Everyone else here is a graduate student, almost. Uh, Ellie welch Jenny was a high school student. She worked with me for a long time, uh, and now she is a freshman in college. And my cat always does work with me as well, OK? So everything I'm telling you is work that I've done with these people and a great number of other colleagues as well over the years. So as I said, we simulate the entire Milky Way galaxy and then we just look at the stellar graveyard. And so this movie that I'm showing you here is a movie starting on the sun, spiraling outward and plotting all the stars in the stellar graveyard from one of our civilizations, uh, civilizations, one of our simulations that Lisa might see. Okay, and what you should notice is that Lisa will see white dwarfs, which are quite dim and not possible to see in ordinary telescopes if they're far away. Lisa will see them across the entire Milky Way galaxy. You should be able to see the shape of the Milky Way. We'll be able to see the bulge and the big flat disk. And we will be able to, for some of the stars, the purple ones that you see here in the image, also see them in telescopes at the same time. So we'll be able to measure those stars with both traditional telescopes and with LISA. And there's exquisite science that we can do if we can uh, make a measurement like that. The big black dots are white dwarf binaries that we've already seen in telescopes. Some of them amateurs have measured for us and we can see from your backyard. Some of them we use much bigger telescopes and we monitor 
uh, them from observatories at professional sites around the planet, okay? We do lots of different things because we do this on the computer, we can change the properties of the Milky Way because we don't actually know what all the properties of the Milky Way are. We only approximately know its age. We don't know what the true star formation history in the Milky Way actually is. We don't know precisely how thick the disk is and how big the bulge is. But measurements with spacecraft like LISA will let us measure those things. So one of the things we do is we simulate the Milky Way many different ways on the computer. And then we ask, how will LISA's view of the Milky Way be different depending on what the properties of the galaxy are? And so this is just one example showing that if we change the population of stars, the thickness of the disk and the bulge, then the two galaxies definitely look different to LISA. One of them is much more collapsed and the other one is much thicker in the center. And so these are the sorts of things that having a gravitational wave observatory will allow us to do. We can measure the, stru uh, the, the structure and shape of the Milky Way precisely because we can see these stars in the stellar graveyard all the way to the other side of the galaxy, okay? So we uh, do lots of different stuff. This is just a very brief kind of overview of the sorts of stuff we do. We could talk for days on end about this, but I'm gonna tie things off here uh, so that we can have some Q and A. Let me remind you of a few things that I think are important to remember from discussions like this. One is technology is really the key to this. We can't do modern astronomy without instruments that enable us to do things that our senses cannot. That's always why we've built big telescopes because big telescopes can see more than you can see with your naked eye. Big telescopes, modern telescopes can see light that your eye cannot see. And now as we are expanding into different types of sensing, we are trying to sense gravity, which is a sense that your body does not even have. No person on earth has a gravitational wave detector built into their elbow. Okay, but we can harness technology in order to uh, measure such a phenomenon. And the consequence of that is that we're going to detect things in gravitational waves that we simply can't detect with telescopes at all. And that's really the great promise of this kind of new branch of science. It is in its infancy. We're only five years into the gravitational wave astronomy era. And by the time the kids listening to this talk today are my age, um, gravitational waves will be as much a part of everyday life in astronomy as using telescopes is right now. Okay, so this is really just the beginning and the future is going to be very exciting uh, and, and fun to participate in. So uh, I always like to leave people with a few things to read and do on their own. Uh, there's a couple of books about gravitational wave astronomy here at the top. Um, both of them are award-winning books. Uh, Einstein's Unfinished Symphony is really about LIGO, uh, the construction of LIGO. It's by Marsha Bartusiak. Those of you who read uh, science books will recognize Marsha's name. She's a very gifted science writer. Uh, this book is really a, a, an exciting one to read because it talks to you about the process we go through to create one of these mega machines. Uh, if you get the second edition of the book, which came out just a couple of years ago, she'll also talk about the very first detections. If you really want to melt your brain and think about black holes and relativity and wormholes and gravitational waves, then Kip's book, Black Holes and Time Warps, um, I think is probably the best one uh, for uh, public consumption. Uh, it's uh, also a very good read and it will give you lots of things to think about and do. If you'd like to participate in gravitational wave astronomy, together with our colleagues at the Zooniverse at the Adler Planetarium, colleagues at Syracuse University in LIGO, uh, we've developed a citizen science project here at Northwestern called Gravity Spy. Uh, we'll basically show you gravitational wave signals like that uh, one that you see there, ask you to tell us what you think it is, uh, humans look at, we've done like 2 million classifications like this, and then we take them to the computers and say, see, this is what we mean, show us stuff like this. And so the computer sifts through the data and uh, helps us recognize gravitational waves. And there's a couple of links there to my blog and videos and a few things that I've written about gravitational waves and relativity, gravity. Okay, so I'm going to end there and say thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to pass it back to um, my hosts, and we can try and take some questions if we want to answer some questions. 
we do. We absolutely do have questions. Um, and uh, before we get to them first, I just want to say, Shane, thank you so much for being here tonight and for coming fully in your Star Trek gear. Um, you know, being a really good sport about it. Well, changing your clothes after you were already here. Um, I didn't want to be <laughs> left out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for everyone out there who can, can't see me, uh, I have some really great news for our neighbors out there. The Veritas, or our Gamma Ray Observatory, has begun limited operations, which means I am in my office and they don't want the lights on. So here I am in all my creepy red light glory. Okay, so um, that's actually really great news. Um, as you guys know, the Veritas closed operations in early March of 2020. Um, we were shut down and not doing any science for a very long time. And then of course the monsoons came and we did not get to do science for the whole summer as per usual. Um, as you all know, we don't do that when there's lightning and thunder outside. And then we just got the green light to start testing and making sure all of the telescopes were still happy and had not been eaten by rats um, <laughs> about two weeks ago. And then we first started uh, operations just in the past few days uh, and started doing testing. They're out there doing a full run tonight. So again, that's why I'm playing creepy Creepy in the dark, okay? So um, really, really excited to, to be here uh, in my office. Uh, again, we won't be open to the public for public programming for quite some time just to keep you all safe and to keep me safe and to keep the person I'm about to talk about safe. So um, the rest of this program will be presided over Whoa. Um, <laughs> I am really enjoying this, you guys. Me and Lena. Uh, uh, I'm going to just turn it off. Okay, the rest of this program will be presided over um, this evening by Stephen Brown. And Stephen is a very beloved volunteer of the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory. He's been very dedicated to us since he came on as a volunteer a little over a year ago. And uh, in, in fact, he just had his one year anniversary in September, uh, I believe. So, you know, everybody has to give a clap um, for Steven. And so he'll be asking questions for Shane tonight. And then he will be presiding over the rest of the program uh, and the, the star party. So uh, thank you again, um, Shane, for being here. And Steven, take it away. Ah, there I am muted. Having troubles like you. <laughs> um, okay, thanks Shane for all of your information you gave. We forgot a uh, one. Our first question was from Nick Co. Um, he was wondering what causes stars to uh, bound together, creating a globular cluster. Okay, that's a that's a really good question. So one, this is still, I would say, something that we don't actually know the answer to. Um, when we study the formation of globular clusters, because of their extreme age, um, it's necessarily also tied into the understanding of how do galaxies actually form themselves. So if you go read about the Milky Way globular cluster system, right, there are stars in the Milky Way globular clusters that we think are 13-ish billion years old, but the, the number that we normally quote for the age of the Milky Way itself is only about 10 billion years or so. So the Milky Way globular clusters are apparently older than the galaxy itself. Now, the question is, how did they get here? Did they form at the same time that the Milky Way was, as we say, assembling? And then they just hung around and aged during the time it took the Milky Way really to get itself put together? Were they formed somewhere else in the universe? And after the Milky Way formed, they attached themselves to the Milky Way? We don't actually know the answers to all of those questions. And in fact, one of the things that we still are understanding is that what we call substructure in the universe is, is, is something that we don't have enough observations about, nor do we understand how it came about. And that's being driven right now, not by the study of globular clusters, but by the study of dwarf galaxies around galaxies like the Milky Way. And so um, we build these gigantic computer simulations, which you may have read about. Uh, they 
take dark matter and gas and all kinds of stuff. And then they, we run them forward in time and we look at what happens. And we see clusters of galaxies form around concentrations of dark matter. We see galaxies break themselves apart into smaller subunits. And the problem we have with those simulations right now is they don't, they, they don't have enough numerical memory still to talk about things quite as small as globular clusters. So we don't really know where they form in this whole story, but we will by the time, as I said earlier, the kids in the audience today are my age because computers are only getting more powerful. Um, we do study globular clusters on their own. And so uh, we can simulate single globular clusters or maybe maybe not an entire globular cluster because it takes a long time. Uh, we do study once they form, how do they stay together? How do their shape and structure change over time? And we're beginning to understand the differences in what we call the morphology, the shape of the globular clusters that we can see around the Milky Way. Okay, thanks Shane. Uh, Nick has another question is, what causes gravitational waves to have a very have vary in shape and strength? So the properties of the gravitational wave depend on the properties of the source that are making the gravitational waves. So the, the two primary things that influence it the most are the masses of the objects involved. So if you have tiny, tiny sources like white dwarfs, which are only maybe half the mass of the sun they make gravitational waves of a certain strength. But if I use black holes, which may be 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun, the gravitational waves are much stronger. The other thing that, the, the second most important thing that influences the shape of the gravitational waves is the orbit itself. So uh, in, in longer talks, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll show you different gravitational waveforms. So circular orbits, okay? So if the stars were going around each other in perfectly circular orbits, make very regularly shaped gravitational waves, kind of the way you would draw an ocean wave when you're in the sixth grade and you're just doodling on the side of your, your notebook. But orbits don't have to be perfectly circular. They can be highly elliptical or oval shaped. So the sources can be really far apart and then they can get close together and, and do like this. And when that happens, the gravitational waves are very strong and then they're very weak and then very strong and then very weak. And so when they're very strong, it's when they're close together and when they're very weak is when they're far apart. And so when you look at the gravitational waveform or you listen to a sound made for the gravitational waveform, it looks very spiky, okay? So somewhere between regularly shaped waves and very spiky waves, the information about what is the shape of the orbit is, is contained. And so that's what we do when we simulate gravitational waves is we look at the different shapes and we ask when I change this property or that property, how does it change the overall shape of the wave? And there are other properties as well. If they're black holes and they're spinning, that changes it. If the star changes shape as it gets closer to the other star, that changes them. There's all kinds of information encoded in these gravitational waves. Okay, thanks Shane. Um... Next question is from Lila. Do gravitational waves affect us on Earth? <laughs> so that's a great question. So I think ultimately that depends on what you mean by affect us. So, so let's, take, let's take the kind of very plain meaning. Could, could I feel a gravitational wave going through me? The answer is no. Gravitational waves are extremely weak, which means they don't necessarily influence the environment around you. And one could argue that's why it took us so long to realize there might be something like gravitational waves. Einstein was the one who predicted this in 1916. But then it's also, they're so weak, it took us 100 years after Einstein predicted them to build an observatory capable of detecting them, okay? But there's a sociological answer to that question too, which is, do gravitational waves affect us? Yes, because the day that we announced the discovery of gravitational waves, the Physical Review Letters Server, which is our main journal that us nerdy physicists uh, read, it collapsed because so many people on planet Earth were trying to download the paper about gravitational waves. So it has the power to capture our attention and really transform the way that we, we think about astronomy and think about science every day. And that's certainly true for people like me who do this professionally, but one of the things that I think probably has surprised us the most is that they have the capability to inspire uh, just really imaginative questions and passion among ordinary folks who you know are truck drivers and 
dentists and lawyers and who knows what, not just among astronomers. It's like somehow Shane got muted there. Okay, if you're done with that, Shane, the next question, last question. Um, when will the sun burn out and will we be here to experience and what might it be like? Okay, that's a great question. So this, a star like the sun, its lifetime is basically regulated by how much hydrogen it has in it. So stars' lifetimes are regulated by how much fuel they have. Um, and the sun is about halfway through its life. So we expect in about 5 billion years, the sun will turn into a red giant. It will eventually slough off its red giant atmosphere, and then it will collapse down into a cinder about the size of the Earth, one of these objects, these stellar skeletons that we call a white dwarf. So given that it's 5 billion years in the future, none of us will probably be here. Whether or not the human race is around or not, that's an interesting question and one that my colleagues and I who talk about space travel and starships and what should the human race do about staying on Earth or going out into the galaxy, we talk about that a lot. Uh, but the end of the Earth is going to come long before that. And that's because when the sun begins to reach the end of its fuel supply, the end of its hydrogen, it's going to change how much energy and light it puts out. And so about 3 billion years from now, maybe 4 billion years from now, the sun's energy output is going to go up. It's going to get hotter on Earth. And at that time, it will vaporize our oceans. And the ecosystem, as you and I know it, will collapse. And so uh, it's going to be a very interesting time here on planet Earth uh, long before the sun actually dies. But when that happens, it will be the vestiges of the beginning of the end. Okay, I think that's the last question. Thank okay. you very much, Shane. Appreciate it. Okay, and kicking off the next part, you know, tonight we're going to be looking at some of the things that go bump in the night, which is perfect for Halloween coming up in a couple weeks. And Halloween, is, uh, it's a full moon Halloween at that. And it's a blue moon. I think. So get ready to see some pretty cool things like ghosts, witches. I guess we've already seen a little bit of a witch here on the Amy's looking like one there, isn't she? And wizards and a throwback to the 80s, but not a scary picture of what Amy's hair probably looked like back then. We don't want to see that. Anyway, our star presenters tonight are some pretty weird guys, too fit to spook you and to thrill you. First up, we have Brian Cummins. Um, he's uh, been on about every night, I think, haven't you, on, on our star parties? Uh, I think so, probably, yeah. Probably one of the, the most normal person on this live web stream tonight. Let's not uh, go well, just, just kidding, Brian. Yeah. But, Brian is a NASA JPL Solar System ambassador from Chandilly, Virginia. Uh, when Brian isn't being a star geek, he's a director and client executive for IT professional services. So uh, he's being a tech geek. They sort of go hand in hand. He frequently can be found disrupting cows and chickens in the name of astronomy. Hopefully you're not tipping cows, but... Uh, I think we know what you're, you're out there in the middle of the night and disrupting all the nature out there. So take it away, Brian. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, hope you hear me okay. I'll assume that's a yes. Cool. Yeah. You're so, okay. um, yeah, as, um, as you heard, my name is Brian Cummins. I'm from Chantilly, Virginia. I'm an amateur astronomer. Um, I'm a member of NOVAC, which is the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, which is one of the biggest astronomy clubs in the country. Um, but there are um, astronomy clubs all over the country and all over the world for that matter. And, and if you are interested in astronomy, interested in what it looks like to look through someone's telescope and to see some of the things that we're going to be talking tonight about with your own eyes, um, 
look up uh, astronomy clubs in your area and you're more than likely to find one that's local. Uh, many like the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club have um, public nights where you can go out and look through, um, look through telescopes. This is the time of uh, time of month where we have a new moon where you're likely to find one. There's actually one going to be happening here at the park that I'm in um, tonight. Um, that's happening tomorrow. So usually around new moon when there's less light pollution from the moon is a great time uh, to go out and participate in one of these. So as, as you mentioned, uh, I am right now in a park called um, Sky Meadows State Park in Della Plain, Virginia. Um, it's about oh, an hour's drive from Washington, D.C. out to the west. Um, it's a great park. We have a great relationship with them here uh, with our club and, and with volunteer work that we do here. As I mentioned, we do the public nights outreach for people to come and look through our telescopes, which is always a lot of fun. Um, it's also a working farm. So they were giving me, uh, giving me a hard time about the cows and chickens, but this is pretty much a view from where I set up. Often there's cows out there. I did not include the pictures of the chickens. They didn't come visit me tonight, but there are chickens and a roost not too far from here. Uh, beautiful park. If you live in this area, beautiful park to come out, uh, visit us for a star party, or if you come out during the day, like most people do, um, you can uh, take advantage of a lot of great hiking and things like that. This park is also, um, they're working through their application to become a, a dark sky site, a recognized dark sky site. Uh, so they're making some modifications here, but it is a beautiful spot out away from uh, the light pollution. Um, and this is a picture of the rig uh, that I normally set up. This is not from tonight, but um, the telescope on the left is the one that we'll be using for um, the views that we're going to be seeing live tonight. Um, this is a refractor telescope that we'll be looking through sitting on an equatorial mount. And right now I've got uh, pictures coming in live and we'll we'll look at a couple different targets. Okay, so where I thought we would start, um, sticking within the spooky theme, I suppose, and actually ties in very nicely with uh, Shane's presentation, is we're going to be looking at the Helix Nebula. Uh, the Helix Nebula is a planetary nebula, nebula uh, that is, um, is a result of, of, a, of a star of about the size of our sun, as Shane talked about, uh, going through its, its evolution, or I suppose depth towards a white, white, uh, white dwarf. Um, so it's here in Aquarius, and I will switch over to, you can see this is where, this is a this is an application called Stellarium. Uh, I think still free if you if you want to download it. You can download it to your phone or you can download it to your computer. Uh, a good way to sort of look around the sky and see, um, you know, see where things are in the sky. Lots of apps available like this, but I also have this connected to my, uh, the mount for my telescope, and it will show us uh, where we're pointing tonight. So I'm going to flip over to the application I'm using to um, to capture these images. So this is, uh, right now I'm taking live images of what's called the Helix Nebula. Uh, it's it's a planetary nebula called, it's, it's cat catalog number is NGC 7293. Um, it's about 650 light years away from Earth. It's one of the closest planetary, closest and brightest planetary nebula um, that's out there. Um, or, or nearest to Earth. It's um, about two and a half light years across um, and has a kind of funky eye type look to it. Um, and if you, I, I'm going to show you a picture. I've been working on this uh, this week in preparation for this. So this is how these photos look as they come in. Um, I'm imaging in using a, a black and white camera, uh, but using different color, different filters to get a, a true color image of, of what this looks like. And if you look right here, kind of in the center of this, uh, that is the white dwarf star um, that has sort of shed this gas, as, as Shane described earlier, when a when a you know, when a red giant star shrinks and starts, it burns through its fuel, and the the core shrinks and it throws off this gas, and that's what we're looking at here. As you mentioned, someday uh, that's what our sun is going to do. Uh, fortunately, we will be long gone, <laughs> long gone by then. So. Um, what I'll do now is I'm going to go to the application that I use for actually processing these photos. This is while you're uh, sorry, this is Amy. While you're doing that, sure. like, um, 
kind of explain really well to everyone why, um, before you show them this really beautiful picture, sure. why we're seeing what we see now. So why um, why is it that your really beautiful picture you took, uh, that I hope you'll maybe be able to show tonight if, if you have it somewhere handy. I've got uh, it. That would say, yeah, excellent. So uh, why is that picture so beautiful and so full of color, but this picture we're looking at right now is black and white? Yeah, why, sure. why do we see that? Why does that happen? Yeah, so, uh, and it's a great question. So um, there are different cameras that you can use for astronomy, for amateur astronomy. Some are similar, so you can use a DSLR for it. Um, there are dedicated astronomy cameras similar to the one that I'm using tonight. Uh, the camera that I'm using tonight actually is a dedicated astronomy camera. It allows us to um, cool the chip um, the, that captures the light and turns that into an image that helps reduce the noise that um, we get when taking individual images. Um, many of us image using a, a monochrome camera like this, black and white, because they are um, very sensitive. Um, and we also have the flexibility of using different kinds of filters um, to gather an image. So uh, what we're using tonight and what you're seeing tonight is using filters called uh, broadband filters. They're sort of they, they give sort of a true representation of of what the color would look like if you were seeing this uh, with your eye. I'm going to show another image after this, and we'll we'll flip over to another target after this, and give you an example of where we're using um, narrowband images, which is uh, filters that filter to a very specific um, wavelength of light that captures hydrogen alpha, for example, which is is the frequency that's that, that's uh, generated when hydrogen gas gets ionized or oxygen or sulfur. So um, essentially with this black and white camera, I will be taking images in red, filtering for red and green and blue. And if you know how an image is put together in a computer, it's red, green, and blue. Um, and you put those all together after you captured the, the light with uh, filters. And that creates a, a color image at the end. So what we're seeing here you can see this sort of ghostly, sort of eye-shaped, um, eye-shaped image, which is a little bit creepy, I suppose. Some people say it sort of looks like the universe looking back at you. Um, and if you look at this, uh, this is sort of an image that I've been working on, a work in progress. So when we take those, when I take those red and green and the blue filters, put them together into an image, um, this is a pretty re pretty good representation of, of that, what that would look like if you could see that with your naked eye. And you can see, you know, it has the appearance of, uh, of an eye, which is uh, pretty cool. This is again, a, a work in progress. I've only probably have six or seven hours of exposure time on this image. And really to do it justice, I would probably want at least double that. Um, but I wanted to capture this and share it with you. And again, what you can see should be right here in the middle is that white dwarf star um, that has essentially collapsed and thrown off this, this shell of gas and dust that's creating this um, this beautiful image for us to, to see tonight. Okay, so maybe what we'll do is um, I will stop taking images of this right now and we will change to a different target. Let me stop this right now. Okay, so the one I wanted to switch to is, stand by, is to switch to um, NGC 281. Um, NGC 281, well, maybe I won't tell you exactly what it looks like. We can sort of figure it out. But um, what I'll do is um, I'm going to resume this, cancel this. I'm going to resume this sequence. And this should change targets here momentarily. You may be able to hear my mount move. Um, and as I look, you can see it's going to start moving here shortly. And you can see the telescope is now moving across the sky. You may hear that in the background. I'm going to flip back to the, the software that runs the camera so you can sort of see what's going on. So as the as the mountain is moving and the telescope is moving to where it expects to find this target, um, what it's going to do is it's going to, the, the software is super cool because it takes a picture of the area where the camera is now pointing. It'll take a picture. It's going to compare that against the database that it has of the sky to make sure it's pointing to exactly where I want it to be. So that's what it's doing right now. It's it's capturing that um, capturing that image. It's doing what's called plate solving, which you can see some windows popping up. 
it's going to compare that and see how far away I am. I'm trying to get this within 50 pixels. It's matched it. We're 218 pixels away. If you can see under the total error um, down here in the screen. So the telescope's going to make a quick move, try it again, validate it. It's going to, again, compare that against the database and make sure that it's pointing exactly where we want it to go. Um, probably didn't need to be within 50. All right, so we're there. So the um, the camera will start taking pictures here in just a second. It may be want to start my auto guider up again, which is good. Okay, so right now it's changing filters. I don't know if you can see that, but it's setting the filter to hydrogen alpha and it's gonna start a two minute exposure of of this particular nebula. It's what we're going to be looking at is NGC 281. Uh, it's about 9,400 light years from Earth. Um, this is a bright emission nebula that's located in um, Cassiopeia, so just up to the, the northeastern sky here. Um, it's got a radius of about 48 light years. Um, and in the, in the center part of it, which we'll see, and maybe I won't wait for two minutes, I think I can go back and pull one that I've got already for the night that I may have pulled? Let me see. No, not yet. Well, we'll wait for it to come in then. So um, what we're going to be seeing here is the, um, it, it's called the, the some people call it anyway, the, the Pac-Man Nebula. Uh, I figured we could use sort of a cartoon character for tonight for Halloween. Um, this is an interesting area for for astronomers. I, I I'm an amateur, but I, I've, I've certainly heard that this is a, a popular one for amateur and professional alike, because it's a it's a great area to see where um, where large blue supergiant uh, stars are formed. It happens that this cloud of gas sits just above the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, so it puts it in a position where it's um, relatively easy for for us to see. Whereas a lot of a lot of them in the area, uh, or a lot of these areas within within the Milky Way are kind of obscured from view. This one happens to be in a good area and it gives opportunity for um, astronomers and scientists to really study uh, in, in, a, in a nice way, um, you know, how blue, young blue supergiant stars are formed. And, and you know, those supergiant stars um, go through a different process for um, when they burn through their fuel. So the the star that we we're looking at and the planetary nebula that we we're looking at um, was produced by a star similar to the, you know, our sun's mass. If you get to about eight times the size, the mass of our star, um, like a like one of these blue supergiants, um, they burn through their fuel much more quickly. Um, and because of that mass and the, the way the, the physics of that work, when they go, they go supernova. And I think we're gonna see uh, in the next presentation some supernova remnants. So we are just about there. I just finished that. So that first exposure is going to come in. And I'm going to stretch that out a little bit more to see if we can see a little bit better. Hold on. OK, so that is a little bit better representation of it. Um, this is a little more difficult to see. You got to sort of use your imagination a little bit. But if you sort of look at this part uh, here, this is sort of the mouth of Pac-Man and maybe the eye of Pac-Man here. Um, so this is one exposure in hydrogen alpha. So this is filtering for a very specific wavelength of light, which is um, ionized hydrogen gas. And so um, the, the stars, the, the stars that are newly formed in here that are exciting that hydrogen gas in that giant cloud are what's, are what's creating those photons and throwing them back to us so that we can see them. So I will flip over to an image that I've previously put together um, using narrowband images. Um, and this is a, sort of a final version of the Pac-Man Nebula that, um, that I've created. And you can sort of see that same type of view. <laughs> um, and you can see uh, there's sort of the mouth of Pac-Man and, and uh, it's, Kind of a cool image, so I'm uh, happy to share that with you tonight. And then the last thing I think I'll share with you is uh, it's not up. I'm not going to be taking active images of it. Um, it will be up soon. Um, and if you are happen to be out stargazing, maybe after midnight, um, you'll see my favorite constellation um, is the Orion uh, constellation Orion. Most of us are familiar with Orion's belt. 
I know uh, when that starts coming up again in the winter, uh, we're all very happy to see it, except on these sort of cold nights when I think all the cold air is blown in from Canada, but because um, it's a balmy like 40 degrees here in Virginia tonight, which is, uh, I'm not ready for this yet. So um, what I wanted to show you is the Orion Nebula, which is uh, a, a bright emission nebula in Orion. And if you um, are familiar with the constellation, kind of down below the belt, sort of where Orion Sword is, is where, um, that nebula lives. It's a star creating nursery. Um, and this is a picture of the Orion Nebula. Let me see if I can make that a little bit bigger for you. Maybe I can't. There we go. So this is kind of a combination of two actually. So this is this on the right is um, the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is a huge area of, of gas and dust. Again, a stellar nursery, this is this whole area is that the mass of all this gas and dust is estimated to be um, something like 2000 uh, times uh, the mass of our sun. And on the left is this other um, is this other nebula. Some people call it the running man. I don't know if you can see it in there, but to some degree, it looks kind of like a, a guy who's running. Granted, some of, the, some of these you have to use your imagination, but um, this is my picture from last year of the Orion Nebula. Um, right in the center of this, and uh, it's easier to see actually um, through a telescope, is four little stars together um, in a trapezium. Um, that's a very common thing for people to see. So the Orion Nebula, this is a very popular target for people looking with telescopes. Very popular target, um, just to look naked eye if you know where to look. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you can see. Uh, um, not quite like this. Obviously, this is uh, this is long exposure photography, which is what you need to bring out the details like this so that we can see it with our eye. Um, but it is visible and, and certainly a very cool target to look at um, in a teles through a telescope. So if you do have an opportunity to get out this winter um, for a star party near you, more than likely some there are going to be telescopes pointed at some at the Orion Nebula. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see it, definitely do that. If they have telescopes near there, just ask them to point it at Orion if they're not in the winter, and uh, you know I think you'll you'll be in for a treat. So I think that's all I had, Amy. Um, that's uh, kind of it from Virginia. Ryan, that's so beautiful. I you know I wanted to know. We have a really good question, and I'm actually going to take the, the the really good question that got asked um, because I'm I'm selfish. But um, <laughs> I asked. I got. <laughs> Census. Um, oh well, well. Shane said he could do it, so maybe maybe we'll we'll pair up on this one, Shane, and we can we can do this one together. But um, so uh, first, I want to ask you: Can Pac-Man eat other things in space? <laughs> can Pac-Man eat other things in space? I got to think about that. Um, I mean, it's not the like a black hole, yes. so I, I, you know. <laughs> we say yes. Yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> and it eat itself and make new stars. <laughs> See, okay, I, I guess that counts. I, yeah, it counts. I gotta turn <laughs> on my light. It counts. <laughs> uh, actually, that's so creepy. I mean, I really like it, but um, so uh, we gotta get some uh, some sort of like we need to just put something against the window in my office. So I'm, I'm sure I'll figure it out. Um, so a really great question. Um, Steven, sorry, I'm hijacking um, for a minute. Oh, we actually do have a really great question for you, um, Brian. And so we'll come back to it in a second. Uh, and, and Stephen will ask it, but for right now I'm gonna hijack. And we had a question from Lila um, about have we ever seen live pictures of or taken pictures of black holes? Okay, so Lila, what a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. So everyone, I work for the Smithsonian Institution, which is a part of, I'm going to say all these big long acronyms, okay, which is part of CFA, which is the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and the Smithsonian. And, um, and then we are a part of something called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And for about 10 years, a very wide network of telescopes across the world who was working to uh, to do that very thing, to try to take a picture of a black hole. And in April of 2019, I'm going to try to steal Can you stop sharing? Share my screen. Um, let's see, here we go. So um, I told you guys I'm the technological error for the evening. So I think you guys can see that. Uh, okay. 
Yes, excellent. So Lila, in April of 2019, this image came out and this orange glazed donut is a black hole called M87. And, uh, and there you have it. So there is our first ever image of a black hole. So it took about 10 years for the Event Horizon Telescope to get to a point where the technology that they had created and been developing was advanced enough that this could happen. Now, um, at this point, this year, just a few weeks ago, actually, we were so advanced in our technology with EHT that we were able to go back and look at the data uh, from the last several years and this happened and i hope you guys can see this so we were able to take all of the data from a 10-year period so you can actually see that going from 2009 um, all the way up um, to 2017 and we basically made a video um, of the movement and the evolution of our uh, black hole shadow Okay, so the shadow and the event horizon um, on that black hole M87 over time. And so what it was doing was uh, wobbling, basically. So it was moving uh, and not staying in the same place. And that formation and that evolution is really important to understanding um, black holes and how they accrete matter um, and, uh, you know, how spaghettification works. And so we're really looking forward to being able to take additional data um, past 2017 and then adding that to this so that we can continue to grow in our understanding of this particular black hole and its nature. So Shane, did you do you want to add anything? I, I feel like you, you need to add some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll add something. So I think the important thing to remember here is that this image it's a spectacular application of technology, like we were just saying. But what you're seeing, the orange, is not the black hole, right? It's stuff the black hole is eating, OK? So this is ordinary matter. It's stuff like what the sun and you and I and the Orion Nebula and whatnot are made of. The black at the center is where the black hole actually lives. And if you, if you ask yourself, what is a black hole? The functional definition of a black hole, it's, it's an object whose gravity is so strong, light can't escape, which means there is no way to see the black hole itself ever with light, only the effect of the black hole like you're seeing here. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I just told you about gravitational waves and black holes aren't solid objects like stars or planets, they are gravity personified. They are pure gravity. And so by looking at the universe, by detecting the universe in gravity, that's the only way we as humans can directly detect a black hole itself, which is one of the really exciting things about gravitational wave astronomy. And so with LISA, what I work on, one of the things we study is big black holes. And what we're hoping to do is combine telescope observations, like the ones that Amy is showing you here, together with LISA observations to be able to tell you more about what the black hole is actually doing. I loved that. That's a really good so question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Asked. And wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing that. So, so um, real, real quick, I have that yeah. should be called the gravitational GIF. That should be that's what it should be called from now on. <laughs> the gravitational <laughs> GIF. Awesome. <laughs> the gravitational <laughs> gift. So I think um, so. Now we actually remember we did have a terrible things are happening here because I'm sharing my screen. Um, but uh, we had some questions pop up right around that same time. And so Stephen is going to take back over. And I think, Brian, if you'd like to take back over screen sharing, um, then, uh, you know, you can continue to show off some of your images on your side while you answer that additional question that we had for you. Okay. Okay, Brian. Well, Nick has a question on how long on average does it take to take a picture of nebulae and other astro astronomical sites? That's a great question. So um, the answer is, uh, it's a good consulting answer, I guess. It depends. Um, for, you can get a good, you know, as you could see earlier, I was taking just two minute exposures on some of the, on the images that were coming in like this. Um, 
this one is just a, a two minute exposure and you can see that nebulosity very quickly. Um, if it's a really bright object like the Andromeda galaxy, something like that, I mean, you can see you can see the nebulosity, you can see uh, the core of the galaxy in, in just a few seconds with an image for sure. Um, however, to put it, to put those sort of sub exposures and to get something that's more along the lines of, of this image here um, requires quite a long time for exposure, exposure time. So what we, the way this is done is, is you, is you create lots of sub exposures. So you know, three minute, five minute exposures, depending on what, what it is that you're shooting. Um, and you take just lots and lots of those five minute exposures uh, over typically multiple nights, um, particularly like in the summer when we don't get much, um, much nighttime um, and time for collecting data is it's done over multiple nights. So this image of the Orion Nebula, if I remember correctly, I think I had about 14 hours of total exposure time. So that's a lot of sub exposures that we put together using, well, using this tool called PixInsight is, is one of the ways you can do this. There are other tools available, um, but it takes all those sub exposures and puts them all together, essentially does what's called stacking. Uh, aligns the stars, aligns the images so that they're aligned perfectly, and then and then you start with um, you start with some data, um, and when and when you first look at it, it just sort of looks like black with some uh, you know with some stars. It looks sort of like a night sky, uh, but as you process the data and work with the data, uh, you really start to bring out some of these details, and you do what's called stretching the data to 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 look for the the, the nebulosity, the, the light that um, that you see here. So, you know, most people, I think, when they image, probably at the low side is is 10 to 12 hours on on a target. Um, I've seen people do as many as you know 60 or more hours on a target. The the advantage of doing longer exposure is you really the, the more time you spend on it, it helps you gather fine details, some of the really faint um, some of the faint details within uh, within the target. Um, and the reason is with all that time, essentially, it really helps you to build the signal to noise ratio that sort of separates what's nebulosity from, you know, what might be like local light pollution or, you know, just light from the moon that you happen to be shooting that night. Um, so yeah, yeah on, the, on the low side, probably 12 hours and up to 60 hours. What's that, Shane? The real question is, you know, you may spend 12 hours taking the exposures, but how much <laughs> do you spend processing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, that sort of depends. So, um, you know, for sometimes a very quick and easy, um, you know, image, you know, might be a couple hours, three hours. Um, I showed one last month that I did of the Andromeda galaxy that was, um, because Andromeda is so big, it's actually a two panel image. I had to take two images and sort of stitch them together um, to, to put that image together. That was... I want to tell you that was probably eight to ten hours of time working on it to to bring out the detail to put all the pieces together and to make it look you know like a pretty image this is um that that is there is some there's a lot of learning curve that you got to get through to learn how to process this data um and how to make it look pretty like this how to clean up the noise how to bring out the fine detail um, how to balance the color appropriately there's all kinds of tools and software available to help with that um, but it, it's it's definitely a steep learning curve. And and if I showed you my first image, the Orion Nebula versus this picture, um, it would be <laughs> vastly different. Um, my first one was not particularly good, but um, it is a, it's a great hobby. Um, it is it takes an enormous amount of time, and so people in your life have to be somewhat patient with you. For I think this is my this is my third night out in four nights, so you know it requires some patience with the people around you, but. Um, you know, it's a great hobby and, and it is certainly a lot of fun to be able to, to create these images, some of the beautiful things that we have out in the universe and in our galaxy. Okay, hey, thanks a lot, Brian, for being Thank you. Thank another you. great part of this night. Uh, I think uh, that was the what? last question. Whoops, I got another one there, just popped up. Uh, do you know what the brown color in the lower left of the image versus the shade of pink is composed of different elements from pink? So I don't know if I could distinguish between exactly what it is, but my hunch is what you're seeing, you know, some of this sort of 
um, reddish brownish is probably uh, more dust and as you get up into in these areas this is more like that pinkish reddish is is more than likely hydrogen gas hydrogen hydrogen alpha tends to radiate sort of a reddish color um, so yeah it's it's this is a huge area of gas and dust, which which actually turns in, you know, create stars essentially is a is a is a stellar nursery. So, so yeah, this is so in um, Orion, yeah in Orion right there in the center, kind of uh, right there. Uh, yeah, Brian will point there. That's called the trapezium, and they're the kind of young hot stars he was telling you about, and mm -hmm. their light is illuminating and energizing that colored gas. But the, the dark region down by the end is what we would normally call if it was off by itself and not around young stars, we would call a dark nebula. It's gas and dust that isn't being illuminated or it's obscuring, it's so thick it's obscuring light behind it. And so the difference here really is those young stars right there energizing it in the center. Cool, thanks Shane. Okay, thanks Marty for that uh, question. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for you, Brian, and thanks again. Thank you. Good night. And we continue on. We're going to go from Virginia to Central Florida. This guy's, uh, first of all, we got Derek Demeter, is the director of the Emil Beeler Planetarium at Seminole State College in Florida. When he's not teaching people about stars or playing Dr. Demetrius Deuteron, he's diving for shark teeth and digging up weird rocks. And there's nothing wrong with that. Frank Kane is a board member at large for the Central Florida Astronomical Society and carries soothing sounds across his setup like a radio host superstar. He's an avid astrophotographer and you can check out his work on boldly dash going.com. Sounds a little Star trek -ish there to me. It? When he's not shooting stars, pun intended, uh, Frank runs Sundog Software and Sundog Education. Hey, we, we're supposed to comment here how we're supposed to pay attention when he's on camera of some of the amazing nerdy things he collects, but he happens to have a background behind him, so we don't see the nerdy things at this point. So, Guys, Central Florida, it's all yours. Look, it looks like he's bringing some of his nerdy things. So, Frank, you'll have to uh, show that off again. Uh, we'll do show and tell all night if you want. Um, yeah, this is my uh, Orville uh, blaster from the Orville. So, blam, there. Yay. <laughs> yeah, and I just went fossil hunting today, this morning. I found some prehistoric shark teeth that were 30 million years old. So... Uh, but I, 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 they're still drying in the garage, so I can't bring them out. But it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> so uh, hello, everybody. Um, so we're going to give you all some spooky and mysterious objects of the night sky. Ooh. Anyways. So, yes, my name tonight is Dr. Demetrius Deuteron, headmaster of the Alpharat School of Science and Spooks. That's what we normally do this time of year at the planetarium, we do this thing called the spooky star party. We normally would transform the planetarium into this giant science, nerdy science spooky school where we dress in costumes and all that. But now, well, this is the closest thing we're going to get to that, but we're going to show you some really cool spooky things. And Frank, uh, Frank, you're the steampunk slash telescope operator of the universe, right? That works, yeah. I, I don't have a cool yeah. name yeah, like you. I gotta make one up. The telescope operator of the universe. Um, that so, sounds super powerful. I love that. Yeah, it's just, well. I mean, look at your background. It looks so like you know. I mean, you have this big Ori, you know, in the back. It kind of looks like like uh, Olga's Ori from Dark Crystal a little bit, you know, it, kind of. Anyways, and you got that like classic looking telescope in the background that probably you wouldn't be using anyways because you know you're not gonna see no. Anyway, that's so, right. All right, so. What we're going to be doing here is we're going to be showing you some really cool objects that have a very Halloween slash spooky atmosphere. But before we begin that, though, I want to go ahead and show you all some really cool things in the night sky. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, Frank's going to kind of get everything ready to show you some of the objects in the sky. And what, if it's okay with you, I mean, I want to talk a bit about 
the Pleiades tonight as well, because I want to talk about the importance of the Pleiades to Halloween and how it, it attaches ourselves to uh, cultural astronomy as well and ethno, ethno astronomy. Absolutely. Um, Definitely do that. That's please. so cool. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in fact, actually, let's do that real quickly here since, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of, um, we'll, we'll talk about some of these. I'll give Frank a few more minutes to kind of get all ready to go. Um, now, over here, hey, of course, Eric, right now, yes. while you're doing that, this is a really good question for you to answer. So, Stephen, if you want to ask him this question, um, because of where you guys are located, yes, uh, you guys have a lot light pollution down there so Stephen's going to ask you this question for Jeremy really quick because I think it's really important and I find uh light pollution to be super scary um you know because we work at observatories and um you know everybody on this uh this panel tonight uh light pollution is one of the scariest things in my life other than the Yagwarundi that are scratching at the front door of the uh, observatory yeah and I'm That's like they have me in here in the dark and I'm like the cats um but uh also the light pollution Okay, from Jeremy, he just asked uh, if I have a Bortle 7 seeing conditions, would it be best to use an extreme light pollution filter or a one pro or enhanced filter? So it sounds to me like he's wanting to use it for astrophotography purposes based on the filters he suggested, which are from Optolon, which are great filters. So uh, when you use a light pollution suppression filter, what it's really doing is it's, 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 it's removing a certain broadband of light, generally in the uh, sodium wavelengths and things like that, because that's where we have majority of the light pollution coming from. With the advent of LED technology, more and more cities and municipalities and counties and states and all that are using LEDs, which are basically full spectrum in, in, the, in, in the case, and it makes it harder for us to suppress the light pollution. Uh, these L light pollution extreme filters are supposed to do a better job at suppressing that. The only issue with that is that if you do use them and they do work fairly well, you just have to expose for longer. So you you know you're filtering out a decent amount of the photons, uh, but you're also cutting the amount of time for the photons to get through the camera. So you have to increase the exposure, um, and you're going to increase the contrast, and it still does not substitute the darkness of a true you know, dark sky. So the best thing to do is really, if you can physically try to travel somewhere, even if it's half the Bortle scale. Now, for those that have no idea what that means, Bortle scale is basically how dark a sky is. So it's a uh, logarithmic. So seven is really bad. Um, and one is really, really good. And Amy, I'm not sure what your Bortle scale is. And, 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 but I imagine over where you are, it's pretty good, right? Yeah, we're about a uh, Mount Hopkins. We're about a two, two and a half most of the time, um, yeah. but you know, light domes uh, are pretty bad. We, we were roughly a three, but you know, I, I'm gonna tell everyone like, you know, our wildest dreams came true in the entire country of Mexico, <laughs> past the light code. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's a huge first, you know, um, France has done some pretty amazing things in that regard as well, but we got really lucky because um, for those of you tonight out there who don't know, where I work, the Whipple Observatory is just about 35 minutes north of the Mexican border um, in Southern Arizona. And so we are right next to Nogales, Arizona. And um, so the amazing uh, light codes on the Nogales, Arizona side of the border do not apply on the Nogales, Sonora, Mexico side of the border. Um, <laughs> and they're in the same place. So it's it's one city split into two countries really. and um, and so that's been a really big deal for us. So we're talking about light domes and it kind of looks like uh, if you put gold frosting and piled it up on a cupcake, okay? Um, like that's basically what a light dome is. You got your little city and you got your light dome of frosting on top. So we have that, um, but yeah, for the most part, but we actually, Derek have a one or pristine conditions less than 70 kilometers from our observatory to the east. Nice. Well, that's much better than what we would have here. We have to go pretty far, at least uh, two to three hours to even get to close to a Bortle 3 sky. And to get a Bortle 1, I have to travel down to Dry Tortugas, which is about 80 miles west off of the coast of Key West. So uh, quite the adventure, but it is worth it, I would say, at least in Florida anyways. 
Um, but anyway, so uh, back to the light pollution suppression filter. It's great if you don't, if you just can't get out to a dark sky site, it's great. Um, but it does not substitute, um, you know, a dark sky. You want to get out to a dark sky. You want to get out to as dark as you can to avoid light pollution. Uh, and, and a lot of, there's actually a lot of software now. I'm sure Brian could talk to you about as well, um, about, you know, with PixInsight and other software, there's, there's uh, things called dark, uh, dark skies or dark subtraction um, dark sky uh, enhancements where you can you can actually uh, flatten the field and try to compensate for some of those gradients created by light pollution. So um, so so there's actually some ways we can combat light pollution uh, you know through post post processing, uh, but again it doesn't it does not substitute uh, a dark sky. Also cooling having a camera that can be cooled significantly will help reduce the noise as well and allow you to enhance the signal. Uh, but again, dark skies are, are very, very crucial when you, when you really want to get out there and do some amazing astronomy. Also lack of humidity too, which is something in Florida we, we, don't, we don't know about, this whole lack of humidity thing. Uh, you know, even in our driest times of the year, we still have over 40 to 50% humidity uh, <laughs> relative. So, um, so anyways, um, Let's talk about real quick this object in the sky right here. So right above this horizon in the east, we can see this bright reddish star called Aldebaran, which is part of Taurus the Bull. This is the Hyades star cluster. Kind of makes a V shape in the sky, making the head of Taurus the Bull. And just above this V shape with this bright red star, the eye of the bull, Aldebaran, we're going to go up there. We're going to see this nice, beautiful cluster of stars we call the Pleiades. The Seven Sisters, or if you're from Japan, Subaru. So if you drive a Subaru, you're driving a Pleiades, basically. So, you know, you know, impress your friends. Let them know that you're driving a, a, a star cluster in the sky. Okay. But it, what's interesting is that to the ancient Celtic people, they saw, when they started to observe the Pleiades in the sky, they used this as a calendar marker. See, back in ancient times, cultures from all around the world used the sky to keep track of the changes of the world they lived in. Seasons, all that good stuff. They didn't have Google Calendar back then. They had to rely on the stars to, for, to see kind of how things were changing throughout the year. Well, to the ancient Celtic people, they saw when the Pleiades would rise just after the sun, they would start to see that the seasons were changing. It would be, the sun would be getting short, uh, will be in the sky less and less every day, and the nights would grow longer and longer and longer. They, taught, they called this transition Samhain, which is summer's end. And uh, during this time, they would, uh, they would start to uh, you know, uh, slaughter the, the, the animals so they can harvest the meat and then also use the bones to uh, make these sacred bone fires. You might have probably heard of something called a bonfire. That's actually where they were a lot of times using these sacred pyres made of bones that they would sacrifice to the gods or whatever the case, spirits, whatever you want to call them. And they would, they would dance amongst these flames to cleanse themselves of the flame of, of the spirits. Well, they would also dress in costumes mocking bad spirits. They would also bob for apples. They would also uh, carve gourds to scare evil spirits. Of course, the New World gourds, which we know as pumpkins here in North America, uh, you know, brought that tradition of carving gourds and things with faces and whatnot. So a lot of the traditions of Halloween that we celebrate today come from these early cultural traditions of observing the changes in our sky. And one of them is the Pleiades. So even though we don't have an image of the Pleiades uh, tonight, I wanted to at least tell you right here, go outside on Halloween night. Not only are you going to look at the moon, but look for the Pleiades. And you'll just see just that connection we have with this with the sky. People from the ancient times were super connected to the sky. And you can see the Pleiades even in light polluted skies. So go out there and look for it. So a little fun information about Halloween uh, coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to move over to the southwest. And we're going to head over to a constellation known as Cygnus the Swan. Now Cygnus is actually uh, part of a grander asterism. We call it the Summer Triangle. Here in Florida, we're still in summer. I know Brian was talking about being 40 degrees outside. I think right now it's still like 80 degrees here in Florida at night. So, yeah, enjoy that cold weather. I actually really wish we could have cold weather. That'd be great. But anyways, bring that cold weather down here. That'd be great. Um, but anyways, 
here in Florida, we still see the summer triangle nice and bright. And uh, you can see these three bright stars here. Uh, this is Deneb here. It's not listed um, on, the, on the software here, but this is Deneb. It literally translates the tail. And it's the tail of Cygnus the Swan. We have Vega here, this beautiful, like, bluish star. We have Altair, which is the eye of the eagle of, Al uh, of Aquila. Well, we're going to look at this area right here. Um, and, and Deneb, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up some labels and some lines. And another thing that people usually find when they look for Cygnus is kind of a cross shape here. We call this the Northern Cross, uh, especially those that um, are at higher latitudes. It's a lot more pr uh, prominent in the Northern Cross kind of pattern. But um, right here is a star called Gaina or Algina. And Algina, just below it, there is a really cool area of the sky known as the Veil Nebula, or in this case, the Cygnus uh, Supernova Remnant System here, this loop, Cygnus Loop. And our first target we're going to go for is we're going to be going for an area uh, right next to the star called 52 Cygnus. Now, this is not associated with this remnant here. It just happens to be a star nearby and, or in the, in the foreground. Are, and this right here, we're going to look at one particular area of this large complex because it has a spooky reference to it. Now, Frank, are we ready to show this image here? Um, yeah, we're about ready to slew the telescope over there. And All right, so I'm going to turn my sharing off here, and I'm going to give you the yeah, engage number one. There we go. All right. <laughs> we're commandeer the video feed here. Commandeer and... the video feed, and we're going to show you all uh, what we call the Western Veil. Uh, which is also known as, Frank, do you want to mention what it's called? Big reveal. It's called the Witch's Broom. So, the uh, Witch's Broom. Amy, Amy's going to love this one. With her sky, huh? Yeah, so we're going to uh, <laughs> command our telescope out there in the driveway to go slew toward the Witch's Broom, which is that uh, area of the south of that supernova remnant there. And so I'll... tell us a little bit about that, Frank, by the way. A little bit different than Brian's situation. Brian's hanging out with cows. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, this kind of ties back to that light pollution question, too. I mean, uh, we're here in the suburbs here in uh, the city of Winter Springs, Florida, and uh, it's a red zone here for light pollution. So uh, it's a bit of a different approach here. We have to use special filters. Uh, we're using a hydrogen alpha filter here to try to cut through some of that light pollution. But we're running this remotely. So I've got this uh, telescope out of my driveway. No cows involved, at least not that I've seen. And uh, we're just controlling this from inside in the office here uh, through a... What you're saying oh, is you don't live where I live because uh, where, where are all my Southern Arizona, like Santa Cruz <laughs> County friends out there say, hey, cows in my driveway. <laughs> Get alligators in the driveway, you know, I mean, that, that's something. Okay, okay, when. Snakes and alligators are definitely what we have here down here, man. Yeah. I mean, we're pretty close to what it's like to be in Australia for in the United States. If people want to know what's it like to be in Australia, come to Florida first. Get a little teaser of what that's like. You know, yeah, a little starter uh, heading over there to Australia. <laughs> we got our first image coming in right now. All so. right, excellent. So what we're doing here is we are using the software, uh, the Sky, um, which is uh, software business actually used by major observatories. And what Frank's doing is he is live stacking. You want to talk about that, Frank, of what live stacking is doing? Yeah, it's kind of a cool approach. So what we're doing is we're taking thirty second exposures repeatedly, and in live real time here, we're aligning those images together. And as we get more and more of these images that come in, they get added together and averaged together. So what happens is every 30 seconds, like it just happened right now, the image will get a little bit clearer, a little bit less noise, and the longer you let it go, the better it will look. And already you can kind of see that witch's broom shape here, right? Does that look like your broom, Amy? Oh, she's muted. She's muted. I, I, yeah, we can't hear her. You know, I, I get one freebie. It looks more like the Nimbus 2000 and mine is more uh, like that, uh, you know, did you guys ever see that movie in the early 90s with Tim Curry called The Worst Witch? Mine oh yes, like everything, is, everything is happening on Halloween. Yeah, I love that music video at the very end. <laughs> yes, that's my broom. I don't have the Nimbus 2000. You have Mildred's uh, broom. I that's do, I have Mildred's broom. All right. Yeah, she had a wacky broom too. So what you're seeing here is a, a piece of this remnant from this, this massive supernova event. And um, as uh, Dr. Larson was talking about earlier about black holes, you know, some of these massive supernova explosions, 
uh, when these cores of these stars continue to collapse under pressure, they they can form black holes. And and and, um, and this one here is 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 not big enough to form a black hole, but it, it was a massive eruption, about 25, I believe the solar mass of this is about 25 times, the original star, I should say, it's about 25 times that of the uh, of the sun. So still a massive star, this huge eruption. Um, and um, just an interesting fact, the, uh, the, the material that has erupted off of the supernova remnant, um, well, it, it, it's actually accelerating and, and continuing to expand um, and the, the velocity of this is about 930,000 miles per hour, uh, which just, just imagine that, <laughs> just how fast this thing is, is spreading out. And uh, astronomers are able to actually watch the, uh, if you essentially create a time lapse over you know, a period of time, you can actually see this, this slow uh, expansion of this. But we're not able to actually get that with this telescope because this thing is massive. This, this whole cloud complex, if you will, supernova material uh, stretches quite a bit. Um, and we're only just looking at one little region of that, uh, that veil nebula that, well, happens to be uh, what we see here. And it looks like it's gotten a little brighter now, which is really good. You can see that detail start to emerge there of the witch's broom. Um, so pretty cool area of the sky. Um, and um, you can actually see this through a regular telescope um, if, you, uh, if you have really dark skies. And there's a filter you can use called a hydrogen beta filter. Uh, you can just, you can purchase one of these and put it on your eyepiece and it actually enhances the, the hydrogen beta lines of the gas found here in the, uh, the Veil Nebula. You can actually start to see that, that, that detail uh, on the, you know, on the, the structure of the nebula. So um, if you have, a little bit of money and you want to throw some get hydrogen beta filter you can actually use this to look at several other nebulas in the sky like the horse head nebula and you have dark enough skies like where amy is you can see uh the 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 witch's broom through a telescope which is really really cool and you need a very very wide field eyepiece in order to see it so all three filters work good on on the veil as well Yes, they do. Yeah, I, 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 we have both O3 and a hydrogen beta, and they are it, the, the the hydrogen beta really pops out. It's pretty awesome. But O3 definitely, definitely will work as well. Yes. So I've seen the veil under Bortle two skies with a four inch telescope and an O3. So you don't need something huge to see it. But exactly. And in fact, actually, it's smaller better because this is a very wide field yeah, image. Field. Yeah, I did that with an Edmund Astro scan. <laughs> All right. Well, those Astro scans are great little scope. Awesome. Yeah. You know. Um, now, were you hand holding it? No. <laughs> no, not for this. <laughs> I have some people that actually hand hold these things, and it's like pretty yeah, incredible. It's in your lap, right? Yeah. Oh. All right. So that's our first target, um, and uh, that's an image. Frank, you want to talk about one of your images here? Yeah. For each of these, I have a uh, sort of a baked in the oven version here. Uh, Kind of what uh, Brian was talking about, where you take a really long exposure through different color filters. This is actually using RGB filters over the course of a few hours. Uh, like you were saying, this is a pretty bright target as nebulas go. So you don't need a ton of time to get a picture like this, but you can really see those different gases in there. So, you know, that blue oxygen that's being emitted and the, uh, the red hydrogen is just a really beautiful supernova remnant and big and bright. It's a great thing to look at. And appropriate for this time of year. So, Indeed. Uh, so go out there and uh, and take a look if you can. Um, and it's, it's it's a fantastic object. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again because we're going to go ahead and move on to our next target. And our next target is another spooky object. And we're going to head over to the constellation of Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia, tomato, tomato, right? Um, and uh, some people say Cassiopeia, some people say Cassiopeia, you choose. But I say Cassiopeia because that's how I learned it, so I guess just that's just how it is. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to head over to the north, and Cassiopeia is a northern circumpolar constellation, so uh, if you're high enough in latitude in the northern hemisphere, you will see uh, Cassiopeia pretty much all year long. Here in Florida, it does dip below the horizon for a, a small period of time, uh, but right now it's nice and high and bright. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for an object uh, located kind of over in this area. Unfortunately, it doesn't show up very well in the Stellarium software, 
Um, it, it's an it's a, it's a international catalog object. Uh, it's not as well known in some of these uh, software pieces, but we're going to head to next is we're going to head to a, a mission nebula uh, called the Ghost of Cassiopeia. So here, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Frank. And again, we're going to look for Cassiopeia here. This is kind of this M shape or W shape. I always say it's either Mario or Wario. Uh, but if you're a Harry Potter fan, it kind of looks like the lightning bolt of Harry Potter. Some people see the, the number three. Some people see a reverse Sigma. If you want to be a math, you know, geek there. I mean, you can, you could, or it just looks like a squiggly line. You know, I mean, it, it, there's really, you know, it's what, what the imagination beholds here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to give it over to Frank. Yeah, I'm going to take this back. I'm just uh, fiddling around with the software again here to try to get that live stacking process started. And let's kick that off right now. So what's causing the ghost of Cassiopeia is actually a fluctuation of a variable star. Um, and uh, we were talking about earlier Cepheid variables, which are very, very uh, earlier in the talk, uh, very, very uh, predictable, very nice variable stars that kind of ping up and down very nicely. This one, on the other hand, is not so, so nice, but it does variate or variable. Uh, this star is basically just shedding off its outer layers. It's, it's basically becoming very unstable when it does this energy that it's that this material that's being shot off at high velocities is exciting the gas around it, which is creating the ghost of Cassiopeia, which is again, a very, very uh, um, fun name to say over and over and over again. Right. Um, but uh, this thing is about 550 light years away. Um, and uh, the, the variable star is actually gamma Cassiopeia, um, which is the star that's, kind of allowing for this, uh, this, 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 this nebula to appear. And uh, this is a very faint nebula. Um, so it's not as, this is definitely not something you could really observe very well through a visual telescope. This is a, a mostly a, a uh, you know, a, a one you'd want to take with a camera. Um, so it's a lot more uh, of a challenge. But Frank, do you want to talk more about this object? Yeah, I mean, as we get more and more time on it, it's going to look more and more like a ghost. It's like a really cool Halloween target here, but it's just a cloud of hydrogen. And uh, thanks to that bright star there, Gamma Cassiopeia, we can actually see it. Um, but you, you're going to see that as we get more and more time on it, uh, you can see, uh, you can't really see my uh, pointer here, unfortunately, but <laughs> it's just going to look more and more like a, you know, a classic, you know, throw the sheet over the head of Charlie Brown kind of ghost here. And you'll even start to see a little mouth there and maybe like eyes. Um, or so it kind of to here. me it looks like the uh, was it the boogeyman from Chris, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas Oogie Boogie or whatever oh, Oogie Boogie name? yes <laughs> it kind of looks like kind of looks like him too I, I see it I don't know anybody yeah. else uh, you know let, let 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 put in the comments if you what do you see here <laughs> anybody else Shane what do you think what does it look like to you is it does it look like any yeah, no, definitely it's good. it looks like a ghost, right? A blanky ghost, right? As, uh, when you're running around the house under your sheets pretending you're a ghost. That's totally what it looks like. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when so we're done, I actually have a Hubble image of this It looks thing. like Dole Whip. Dole Whip. Dole Whip. <laughs> All right. Dole Whip. Well, you know, hey. <laughs> I could see that. You know, just put a bunch of Dole Whip in the universe there, you know, with your witch's broom. There you go. Just so, so Frank, is oh, wow. dim cast changes brightness? Are there nights where you can't see this at all? Or, or is it always just a matter of how long you, you take the exposures for? Oh, it's always visible. You know, I, okay. I haven't actually noticed any variability. I've only photographed it twice and didn't really notice a difference in the two nights. So I don't okay. think it's that variable. Huh. Yeah. We also be heard like uh, someone sees a bird. Was that, Shane? Well, then it'd be like a real ghost. It would appear and disappear because the yeah. nebula oh. itself... That would be cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Extra yeah, cool. no, the very yeah, this is not a the star is uh is not um <clears throat> I, I don't think the bright I don't think the variability is as, as prevalent in days. I think it's you know yeah. I think it's months. Um, you know, it's it's a very it's a very slow variable star. It's not like uh algal or something that changes in a, in a matter yeah. of days. The demon yeah. star, right? The demon star, <laughs> which actually we could talk about that too. Uh we didn't take an image of algal, but we can talk about algal. Um, since we're kind of in that area anyways, but, uh, 
but uh, yeah, here we go. How how many how many expo- we're at uh, how how much time now with this? Uh, Frank, I actually had to restart it because of a tracking error. So we're just down to one minute so oh, far okay. again here. So give it All a couple right. of minutes here. It'll be worth it. Yeah. So uh, so yeah. So so this again is a very obscure object. Um, again, something you definitely I'm uh, not going to really see it um, with a telescope um, visually. But this is a great challenging target for those that want to uh, get a, a cool image uh, with their with their telescope. So Brian, maybe this might be something. Have you have you ever, ever imaged this, Brian? Is he, is he still on? He's out there somewhere. He's out there somewhere in the the cow pasture. Well, anyways, I was curious to see if he had a chance to image this at all. But yeah, you're, I'm starting to kind of see now um, the wisps along the end there. It kind of looks like a ghost traveling around in, in, in the sky. Yeah, it's kind of emerging from this larger cloud of gas called IC59, and we're starting to see some hints right. of that to the left of the, the image there. And that's all part of this massive hydrogen cloud. Of course, hydrogen is the most you know abundant, uh, you know, uh, fi- normal matter that we have in the universe. There's just dark matters, dark energy, but we also have you know normal you know matter and and or what we consider normal matter, stuff that we you know uh, can detect visually um, and uh, hydrogen is you know pretty much most of it out there is hydrogen right i mean that's essentially the most abundant uh atom out there is uh is is hydrogen so um you know most of these objects that we look at in the universe are primarily made of hydrogen and um so the next object we're going to look at is actually a place where we're seeing stars form from this hydrogen which is Mm -hmm. pretty neat so it's they're almost coming into being because of of a magic trick from a wizard well we'll talk about that in a second move on yeah So let me uh, cut to a sort of a finished image of this then. Uh, So, you know, if you let this go for a few hours or more like seven hours, it ends up looking like that. Here we go. And that looks a little bit more ghostly to me. I don't know about you. It's so much black and white. Yes, it's intentionally black and white. (laughs) Any color, Frank? I think that you just did this in hydrogen alpha, right? I did. It's just in hydrogen alpha. So uh, I intentionally kept it in black and white to make it look more spooky. But Okay. It's uh, it's mostly hydrogen. It would just be red in real life. Uh, we do okay. have a Hubble image of it as well, uh, where they kind of like uh-huh. zoom in on the head of it there. And if you use your imagination, you can kind of see some eyes in the mouth there even. So definitely a <laughs> yeah, spooky I I target. It almost looks like um, Stinky from Casper. <laughs> <laughs> That's going deep. <laughs> That's going very deep. Anybody know who I'm talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> <That's Wow. from laughs> it looks like uh if you guys didn't see it, was, I, I made a comment in the back it looks kind of like oogie boogie yeah yes. 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 We agree. um before we before it got all pretty um someone in the thread said uh, it looked like a bird which i agreed with oh it, yeah it, i can see it, it, it almost looks it like it. i can see the old school duck hunt duck do you see like I, I can't point it but see like on the left you can see the beak Oh and yeah, high, and it's flapping its oh. wing. Now I'm seeing like the Battle of the Planets Phoenix spaceship. Yes, yes, yes. All right, that too, that too. Yep. There you go. <laughs> oh man, moving on. We're we're going we're going too far. <laughs> we're going too far with our. Nerves. That's old school. <laughs> yeah. All right, so what we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again because we're gonna take a look at um, an area not not too far. Actually, before we do that, well, we'll give Frank a few minutes to kind of get his stuff set up. We're going to head over to Perseus, which is right next to Cassiopeia here on the uh, on the right. There's a beautiful star cluster here, uh, the double cluster that's in between Cassiopeia and Perseus. A beautiful set of two open clusters. Definitely check those out if you get a chance. Uh, it's just basically in between the head of Perseus, which is here, and the uh, the star right here called Rukbog, which you know eh, we'll just say it's the the star that kind of goes up from the from the center point of Cassiopeia. But down here towards uh, Perseus, right here is a star, Al Ghul, which is literally, supposedly, according to Greek mythology, what they saw was the eyes of Medusa. Yes, because this star did dim and brighten uh, over time. This was a vis- visual uh, variable star. And they called, they were they're very uneasy about that star, so they called the Ghoul Star or, or the Demon Star. And, uh, and of course, in the context of Greek mythology, the eye of Medusa, where looking into the eyes of Medusa will turn you into anyone? Stone. Stone, that's right. Stone, yes, it turns uh, you 
not an art class. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stone, yes. Uh, so that I thought that would be an, another fun, ghoulish star. But what we're going to do is we're going to head over to the left side, or in this case, towards the north, the, towards the uh, side. If you use the middle part of Cassiopeia, we can use it like an arrow marker. This points over to what I consider the Dr. D's drawing of a house. You got the square here, and then there's the roof, or because I'm from Florida, it's hot all the time. We have some ice cream. There's the ice cream in the ice cream cone. But this is Cepheus the king. We have Cassiopeia the queen, Cepheus the king. And located in Cepheus is another constellation, or no, excuse me, another nebula. Uh, unfortunately, this software does not point it out as well because it's kind of obscure. But this one we're going to look at is what, Frank? The Wizard Nebula. Wizard. That's yeah, actually, I think you be, yeah, I guess you are the wizard tonight, Frank. You are the wizard of the universe. I'll go with that. Yeah, we'll with that things. works. This is your nebula, so. <laughs> All right, so we're going to command the telescope to uh, slew on over to the wizard nebula right now and start some stacking on that. And off it goes. There it goes. So we didn't have to go too far for this object. Uh, just far enough to freak out my neighbors when they see that thing moving on its own out there in the driveway. Now, there was one time we were doing one of these star parties, uh, virtual star parties, and there was there was a person riding a bike back and forth, probably trying to figure out what this thing is in the driveway. When I have the uh, the scope cam out like I do right now, like you capture some curious people once in a while. Um, I've, I've had people walk back and forth a few times, kind of giving it the stink eye, like, uh, what is that thing? <laughs> Some people think no, it's a telescope. Some people think that I'm like shooting down an aircraft or something, but yeah, you know, well. With a death laser, that's what it is. Yes, yeah. with a death laser, yes. Focusing the, the, the beam so intense it you know, shoots at the. That'd be cool. All right, so uh, what we're going to be looking at now is called the Wizard Nebula. This is a large star forming region over 7,000 light years away. So we're talking pretty far here. Um, and star forming regions are these huge plumes of, of hydrogen gas, they compress and eventually form new baby stars. Oh, isn't that cute, little baby stars? Oh, so man. just like a magician or a wizard, you have these stars that come into being, right? He, you know, the, the wizard will poof, and then they come in. But of course, uh, the universe is a giant recycler, right? So most likely these stars were formed from material that has exploded out into space, and all that hydrogen gets uh, compressed due to gravity and over time forms new stars like our sun. Our sun is a is a is a is a second generation star. It's a star that formed after the initial major stars in the universe and it's recycled. So in a way, you know, everything in the universe is the universal recycler. And uh, this is what we have here with this. Uh, so, Frank, um any interesting points about the Wizard Nebula that you like? Do you actually see? I, I've been trying to look at this for a long time, and I just cannot see a wizard you know, here. Well, something. with this exposure time and this weird angle, it's really hard to see a wizard. But uh, when I show you the finished image, I think it'll be a lot easier to okay. figure it out. Once you all see right. it, you'll never unsee it, I promise. Okay, all right. So it's one of those situations, yeah. All right. It is. Excellent. But you're right. This is also uh, known as a star cluster and not just a nebula. You know, this is, That's you know, true. Weird where uh, stars are being born. So how cool is that? Yeah, so those those stars you're seeing that are tightly bound, like, like the Pleiades were formed from one of these nebulas. And over time, they'll drift apart away from each other and uh, and, 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 and get wider and wider and more open and open until eventually they're not as associated the way we would consider an open cluster. And the same thing will occur with these, these nebulas and these star clusters as well. Um, so... Pretty, pretty cool. And this is uh, this is over three full moons in size from what I from what I've uh, understood. So this is a very large swath of the sky. Mm -hmm. And we're only looking at a, a, a ma uh, the, the major core of this nebula, but it actually expands out quite a bit uh, if you were to get the whole thing. So, Frank, maybe you can get a full mosaic of this this massive uh, cloud complex here. Of, Ooh, challenge uh, accepted. Challenge accepted. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, let's uh, just cut to that uh, finished image there so we can try okay. and like actually yeah. find the, the wizard. So the wizard here is actually lying on its back. So keep that in mind. And if we kind of rotate it a little bit, it looks like this. And this is a uh, narrow band image with some special color processing. And I, unfortunately, you can't see my, my cursor here. But at the top there, you see kind of a cone-shaped thing. Imagine yeah. that's the wizard's hat. Okay. 
and there's a bright blue star there that could be his eye. And he has kind of this weird nose that kind of looks like a, a who or something from Dr. Seuss. Uh, anyone seeing it yet? Two arms down there in the middle there, kind of like outstretched. And maybe oh, he's yeah, like okay. over this cauldron of bubbling stuff at the bottom. <laughs> anyone? Anyone? Am I the only one who sees it? I, I see it. And there's even a little crescent moon for kind of where his cap is. You kind of see a little so, crescent. Yes. So you're looking at, yeah, you're looking at the dark inclusions as the wizard outline, right? Yes, exactly. That's like his hand is kind of stretched out like a webbed hand or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Right yeah, next that, to his that hat. Goes. Okay, that's cool. You got it. Sure. Shane sees it. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone called it the Wizard Nebula for a reason, so let's, let's go like, that. like, what is happening to him? Is he falling into, like, an ocean? He's breakdancing. <laughs> I, I like to say I he's like he's conjuring it. a cauldron or something or uh, like in the Wizard of Id where he has that like smoke monster. I think that's what he's making. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the beauty of these nebulas is, you know, uh, everybody sees something different. It's all that paradelia that we have in our brain that, you know, mm -hmm. makes us pick your picture faces and things like that. Actually, I'm kind of seeing um, almost kind of like the witch head in Orion, which is also another object too. Um, uh, we talked about Orion earlier with the Orion Nebula. Another great object to look at is a reflecting nebula uh, uh, called the witch head nebula. Um, and it's, that's a fairly faint object too, but it kind of resembles that to me. You gotta have the head and the beard. Kind of the back, the bottom is kind of the beard, kind of like a Gandalf character. I don't know, yeah. but anyways, everybody yeah, the shapes that our brain. Hmm? <laughs> I was gonna say the shapes that our brains make out of it are have no scientific value really, but it's still fun. It makes astronomy fun, so let's go with it. Exactly. Who knows? There could be astronomers watching tonight that discover something new and they 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 call it something because they watched on Netflix or something. Who knows? Who knows? what new objects will be discovered and what crazy things they'll name them. So, but yeah, that's how, that's what we have for tonight for deep space objects. So I hope that you all enjoyed our spooky and kooky night sky tour. And I hope that you all have a wonderful Halloween and uh, yeah, any questions we'll be happy to. Late, be happy late to question from Nick says, what are the reasons for the strange formations of some <laughs> nebulae or is it just random? The strange, the strange formations in the nebula. I mean, the shapes, or um... I, I think that's what he's getting at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They all look different, right? They all do look different. Um, it, it, well, I mean, I, Shane, you could probably talk about gravity. Gravity has a lot to do with it. Um, interactions of stars and things uh, like that. Yeah, I for for a lot of these, you know, we're talking about like the 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 witch's broom. That's a supernova remnant. So that's all about how the star exploded. Correct, but yeah. For the ones where stars are being born, like this wizard and the, the one up in Cassiopeia we were looking at, you know, those are multiple nebulas from the galaxy that over time, I think, as, as Derek said, have been collected together. So it's just, you know, it's like mixing streams of water and mud in your backyard, right? They, they mix <laughs> together and they see each other and they attract each other and push each other around and develop these exotic structures. And then once the star's born, then, you know, the stars put energy and different kinds of gravity into it, which stir them up too. So yeah, and, and, and some, of these, yeah. some of these newborn stars have solar winds to them that push material, kind of like blowing a, a cloud or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of interactions going on in the uh, in these objects. So, yeah, so it's random in terms of what they look like, but it all is based on interactions of things around them. And for things, things like the Cygnus loop, right, as professional astronomers, we use those shapes to try and tell us about what happened long ago in the past that we didn't know about, right? So you were talking about how it was expanding outward still, right? If you imagine that motion and you run it backwards in time, we'd like to think it'd tell us where the star that blew up came from. But of course, we've looked and we've never found what's left, the neutron star or black hole, but that's, that's the sort of thing we like to do, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Don't think there's any more questions, Amy. Uh, All right. Well, uh, everybody, thank you so much. You know, we, we had a long star party tonight. And, and, you know, the reason that we're able to do these these types of events and to go for, for two hours is because of you guys. 
because you're out here and you're asking great questions and you're engaged and you love the night sky and you love what's going on at the observatory and you know you love our speakers and we're so lucky to have Shane uh, here tonight with us and we're so lucky to have our friends uh, on the East Coast to help us out. And, and be able to do these types of things, you know. So for those of you out there who don't know, uh, at the Whipple Observatory, our uh, our telescopes, our big telescopes, are robotic, uh, and they don't have eyepieces on them, right? So they have um, they have robots on the backside. Uh, the MMT, you know, it's small instruments of the size of a car. Um, <laughs> so uh, if if we had an eyepiece really for that that we could just put on very easy, you might need to be the giant from Gulliver's Travels to just look right through it. Um, and so uh, it, it's fun for us to be able to uh, work with our friends uh, in Virginia and in Florida. If you've been with us before, you know, we have friends in everywhere. Um, <laughs> you know, Kansas, uh, we've had friends from Kansas, Indiana, Colorado, uh, Utah, Arizona, California, uh, join us. And so the, the really beautiful thing about this program is being able to look coast to coast um, and, and have those opportunities to see the night sky in different ways and to engage with our friends. So Thank you again so much um, to everybody. And I want to give a big shout out to Nick, uh, Nick Koch. He's out there, Koch, he's out there in Patagonia, Arizona. Um, and uh, he's one of our favorites. I love to embarrass him a little bit uh, uh, just because he he's a great, you know, he just was finished up high school not that long ago and has a great um a great future ahead of him in physics or science or math, uh, everything. Um <laughs> so uh uh Thank you again uh, to the Koch family um, for always being here and for supporting our observatory and, and to everyone else who was here tonight. And, and to Mitzi Garland, thank you so much. Uh, she said from Central to, I don't know where that is, but we're so glad you're here. Um, if someone else on this panel knows where that is, please tell me where that is so I can, can uh, announce it. But um, thank you so much again for everyone for being here. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for coming back. Um, Panelists, please don't leave for just a second. We're gonna take a, a group <laughs> screenshot. And um, everyone, thank you again so much. Have a wonderful evening. Go outside and look for Cassiopeia. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Uh,